Hello, I'm Seema and welcome to part 16 of the chapter Hello Elkanes and Hello Arenes. In the previous video, I told you about the mechanism of nucleophilic substitution. And I told you that there are two different ways, two different pathways, how nucleophilic substitution can take place. One mechanism was the SN2 mechanism or nucleophilic substitution by molecular. And we did that in the previous video. In this video, we are going to, I'm going to be explaining the SN1 mechanism to you. That is the nucleophilic substitution unimolecular. When I said SN2, I told you SN2 mechanism is called SN2 mechanism or bimolecular nucleophilic substitution because it has, it follows the second order kinetics. And so from the name itself, you can guess that substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. Unimolecular means that the concentration of only one molecule is important. So this is the mechanism that follows first order kinetics. Many, uh, what is a first order reaction? A reaction in which the rate of the reaction depends only on the concentration of one of the reactants. It means that even if there are more reactants present in a particular step, this reaction first of all would take place in steps. And in one particular step, there would be the involvement of only one reactant. And in that step, or rather that step would be the slowest step. Because whenever a reaction takes place, in a number of steps, the, that step which is the slowest is the rate determining step and the uh, rate, the concentration term of the reactant to which um, of that reactant or the reactants in that step, that would decide the order of the reactions. Whatever is the order of the reaction for that particular step would be the order of the reaction too. So we say in this video, we are studying the mechanism of substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. Again, the reason why we write substitution nucleophilic unimolecular is because when we write the symbol, we write substitution nucleophilic and one means unimolecular, one molecule. So it follows the first order kinetics. This is the first important thing why it is called unimolecular substitution. And usually it takes place in polar protic solvents. What is a polar protic solvent? Polar, you understand, any molecule in which the positive and negative charges are separated is a polar molecule. So a solvent whose molecules have got polarity in them would be a polar solvent. So what about protic? We know in chemistry, usually when we talk of proton, from hydrogen, a hydrogen atom which consists of one electron and one proton, if you remove the electron, all you are left with is a proton. So usually H positive ion is known as the proton. So when you say polar, you understand something which has charges and protic, it means it has got H positive or hydrogen atom in it. So it's a polar protic solvent. What is so special about polar protic solvents? And there is one more little thing that has to be specified when you talk of polar protic solvents. In polar protic solvents, the proton or the hydro, it, it, they do consist of hydrogen, that is the proton, the source of proton. And hydrogen in these should be connected either to oxygen or to nitrogen. Now, what is the reason for that? The hydrogen should be attached either to oxygen and nitrogen. When is it that when hydrogen is attached to oxygen, nitrogen and chlorine and uh, oh, sorry, fluorine, it leads to formation of hydrogen bonds, right? So when we say a polar protic solvent is one that is polar, it has got a proton and it has got hydrogen, which is attached either to oxygen or to nitrogen. It means it should be capable of forming hydrogen bonds. That is the definition of a polar protic solvent. So now we say that usually these reactions, that is the SN1, the nucleophilic substitution follows the SN1 mechanism when the solvent is a polar protic solvent. Examples of polar protic solvents are water. It has got hydrogen attached to oxygen and it is it has H positive, a source of protons, ROH, CH3COOH, etc. Now here is a reaction, a substitution, a nucleophilic substitution. OH negative is the nucleophile and you have got tertiary bromo, what would you call butane? Tertiary bromobutane, it reacts with OH negative, that is the nucleophile attacks it and it leads to the formation of tertiary butyl alcohol and um, 
bromide ion is given out. So this is the overall reaction that took place. But in order to understand the SN1 mechanism, this reaction should have taken place in two steps. Because if you look at this, this appears to be a reaction of second order. It has got two reactants and the concentrations of both of them should be important. But when you actually see the mechanism of this reaction, it takes place in two steps. In the first step, the CH3 whole thrice CBR, that is the tertiary uh, butyl bromide, this turns into a carbocation. It loses the bromide ion, that is Br negative, uh, breaks down, it breaks down and it leaves as Br negative and you get a carbocation. And what is carbocation? The carbon in the middle, this I should have written a C here, CBR. CH3 whole thrice CBR. So the carbon in the middle is here, which is attached to three different methyl groups and the bromine leaves as Br negative. It takes both the electrons with which it is bound to carbon and it results in the formation of the bromide ion. Therefore, carbon becomes deficient in an electron and acquires a positive charge. So this central carbon becomes positively charged and this now is known as the carbocation. Once the carbocation is formed, so in SN2 mechanism we saw the reaction took place only in one step. But in SN1 mechanism, the reaction takes place in two steps. In SN2, a carbocation was not formed. There was just a transitionary state, uh, a transition state where uh, the nucleophile and the leaving group were attached to the methyl group or the carbon, the alpha carbon simultaneously. And then one uh, joint while the other left, leading to an inversion in the configuration. But here we see that a, car a proper carbocation is first formed. Now the nucleophile comes and attacks this positively charged carbon. So the reaction is taking place in two steps. First is the first step is formation of carbocation. And in the formation of carbocation, the halogen leaves as the halide ion and results in the formation of a carbocation. And once the carbocation is formed, in the next step now, the nucleophile attacks that positively charged carbon and gets attached to it, resulting in the formation of the alcoholic group or the substitution. Now, the first step, why do we call it, uh, uh, why does it follow first order kinetics? Out of these two steps, the first step is the slow step and it is a reversible step. Since it is the slowest step or it is the slow step, the reaction, the rate of the reaction actually depends on this. It's very easy to understand this with an example. You are all going in a group as a family and you're going for a walk. And when you're going for a walk, there's a little baby who walks very slowly and there's an old grandmother also who walks really slowly. Out of the baby and the grandmother who walk slowly, the all others are younger and they can walk faster. But that little baby who cannot walk properly and the old grandmother who cannot walk properly, the speed with which the entire group is going to walk is going to depend on the slowest member. So the rate of the walk will depend on that member who is the slowest. It is the same thing. The reaction is taking place in steps, but that step which takes the longest will decide how fast the overall reaction will take place because this is a quick, this is a quick step. So how slow it is will not depend on this step. The rate of the reaction will depend on the slow step. So we say step one is slow and it is reversible. And where does it get this energy for breaking this bond? How does, from where does the compound get the energy to break the CBR bond? So the energy that is used for breaking the CBR bond is obtained from the solvation of the halide ion. The halide ion gets solvated and for that the presence of the protic solvent that is H positive was required and it was polar, it was protic and it could form hydrogen bonds. So when it forms hydrogen bonds, it makes it stable. It makes it easier to remove the bromide ion. So a polar protic solvent helps the first step to take place. But the rate of the reaction depends on this first step, which is slow and the rate determining step. So 
The energy for breaking the CBR bond is obtained from solvation of the halide ion with the proton, that is the H positive, of the protic solvent. Since the rate depends on the slowest step, it depends only on the concentration of the alkyl halide and not on the concentration of the alcohol, the source of the alcohol. It depends only on the concentration of the alkyl halide and not on the concentration of the OH negative ion. Because once the halide leaves and the cation, carbocation is formed, the OH negative quickly joins to it because that is just an electrostatic attraction. Positive and negative attracting each other and becoming stable. So that is a quicker step. So this was about how you how the reaction takes place in two steps and how its, uh, its rate depends on the slowest step. Now, greater, now what does this depend on? How does, what are the factors which would affect whether a chemical will undergo, or a haloalkane would undergo SN1 mechanism or SN2 mechanism? For SN2 mechanism, we did it in the previous video. Let us now understand how does it, how does the, um, how does the presence of those methyl groups affect the SN1 mechanism? We said the greater the stability of the carbocation. We used the polar protic solvent so that it helps in the formation of the carbocation. But if the carbocation that is formed is more stable, then that also favors the reaction. Anything that is helping this step would be favoring the, the SN1 mechanism. So what are the factors? How does a carbocation become more stable? So let us see that. So the greater the stability of the carbocation and easier and faster the SN1 mechanism will be. And if it is, you know, whenever a, a chemical or a haloalkane is trying to undergo the nucleophilic substitution reaction, there is a competition between whether it would follow the SN1 mechanism or would it follow the SN2 mechanism. So which mechanism it follows depends on these factors. So what is the factor that will decide if, first of all, the solvent should be polyprotic, only then SN1 mechanism will be followed. Second, that the carbocation that is formed should be stable. And what is, what is found? That a tertiary carbocation is more stable. You remember yesterday when I gave you that example of uh, uh, people in the bus and if they were bulkier groups on the carbon atom, bulkier if they were methyl groups, they were like tennis balls. And too many, and if they were people, they were holding bags, they were holding hall dolls, they were holding dogs, cats, babies and all. And therefore, that person who has to jump into the door of the bus, doorway of the bus, finds it really difficult because it's so crowded. So the bulkier the groups, the more difficult it was for SN2 mechanism to be followed. On the other hand, the bulkier the groups are, the more stable is the carbocation. Therefore, in that case, instead of SN2 mechanism, SN1 mechanism will be followed, right? So the tertiary carbocation is the most stable, then is the secondary carbocation, then primary carbocation, and the least is methyl halide. And because in methyl halide, all the three are hydrogens. The, to the carbon, all three groups which are attached are hydrogens. In that case, SN2 mechanism would be the one that would take place faster. So we find that the sequence of reactivity of SN of uh, haloalkanes that undergo SN1 or SN2 is opposite. The sequence is just the opposite. Tertiary halide, secondary halide, primary halide, and methyl halide. For SN2 mechanism, the, the ease of the reaction increases in this direction. But for SN1 mechanism, the order is the opposite. A tertiary halide, it is easiest for a tertiary halide to follow the SN1 mechanism and it is the most difficult for methyl halide to undergo SN1 mechanism. This would rather follow SN2 and for these there would be a competition. There would be other factors that would determine which, which mechanism would they follow. Now, for the same reason that uh, tertiary carbocation is more stable, 
Allylic and benzylic halides also they show a high reactivity towards SN1 mechanism. Why? Because their carbocations are also more stable. Why are their carbocations more stable? Because they undergo, the carbocation undergoes resonance. And due to resonance, you are aware that wherever there is resonance, resonance imparts stability. Therefore, when you have, for the same reason, allylic and benzylic halides, they show high reactivity towards SN1 mechanism because the carbocation is stabilized by resonance. Resonance takes place in them. Now, this is an allylic um, halide CH2, CH, CH2. The double bond is here and this is the carbocation. The positive charge is on this carbon. If the double bond, the electrons of the second bond, they shift to this direction to fulfill the deficiency of electron here. You know, the electrons of the second bond are very helpful in nature. They always try to help out by uh, fulfilling the needs. They help out by giving, moving to the direction where the electrons are deficient. So when they do that, the double bond comes here, but this carbon becomes positively charged because both the electrons of the double bond, they moved here. So both the electrons means one electron was of this carbon and one was of this carbon. So it took both the electrons, it took the electron of this carbon too. So this carbon now becomes deficient in the electron. Therefore, the positive charge shifts here. And this, both of these uh, canonical forms, they they exist, they coexist. Therefore, it leads, this is resonance. And whenever resonance is there, it's a more stable, it imparts stability. And therefore, this, this uh, allylic halides would also undergo SN1 mechanism or would follow SN1 mechanism. Then come benzylic halides. This has been the carbocation formed in a benzyl compound. You have CH2 here, the carbocation, the positive charge is here. And we know in the benzene ring, the, there is resonance already there and there are alternating double bonds. This, the second bond here, now the electrons of the second bond jump here to the, this bond in order to fulfill the, uh, the need of the positive charge or to remove the positive charge to fulfill the need of electrons. So a double bond is formed here as a result of which this carbon loses its electron and the positive charge shifts here. As soon as the positive charge comes here, the next neighbor is sitting, okay, oh my God, you're positively charged. Let me help you. We'll come, we'll come and we'll take your place and we'll help you with the charge because charge is like a load, you know. So these two electrons quickly move that side to remove the charge. And as soon as that happens, this poor carbon whose electron was being used in the second bond loses that electron and the positive charge shifts here. As soon as this happens, the next neighbor, neighbor of a double bond, the second bond moves its electrons to that to remove that charge. And therefore, this becomes the double bond and therefore the positive charge shifts here. When this happens, these two electrons again say, oh my God, you're positively charged. Let us help you. This comes back. The bond comes here and the positive charge goes back to CH2. So all of these forms, they are interchangeable, they keep occurring and this movement of the uh, delocalization of the electrons to lead to resonance leads to stability. Therefore, these are also stable carbocations and would undergo SN1 mechanism and not SN2 mechanism. And as far as the order of the halogens is concerned, I, whether it is for SN1 or for SN2, for both of them, iodine here, the reason for this order that alkyl iodide has the greatest tendency to undergo SN1 or SN2 more than RBR, more than RCL, more than RF. And this sequences because of their bond dissociation energies. In iodine, the iodine atom is the largest in size, therefore the bond length is the greatest. And since the bond length is the greatest, it is easiest to break the bond. And that is why whether it is SN1 or SN2, the iodide for the same alkyl group would be most reactive and the fluoride would be the least reactive. So this was the order of the uh, re uh, reactivity of different species for following the SN1 mechanism. With this, I'll wind up this video. If you found it helpful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends, and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.